Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining me. I've just quickly scrolled through the participants and I see some people I haven't seen in a while and would love to see again and some of our colleagues. So hello, all of you. Um, I, I wish we were here in person, but um, this is our current situation. I'm going to give a very short introduction to somebody I suspect many of you know, which is the wonderful Michael Steinloff, so as not to take up too much of our time. Um, so Michael Steinloff is a veteran of many things, um, of Poland in the 1980s, of Colombia in 1968, of revolution, of Jewish revival, um, and a professor of East European Jewish history. Um, we are here today um, to talk about a very special book that has just come out in English um, called This Was Not America. Um, the book is in a very particular genre, which doesn't really exist on this side of the Atlantic, but is in fact one of my favorite genres. Um, it's a, in Polish, you call it a vivia dzeka the kind of river interview, which is a long dialogue conversation. In fact, really a kind of series of conversations woven together, um, generally between two thinkers, you know, that turns into a book that's not in monological form, but in dialogical form. And this book goes through a kind of extraordinary autobiography. Um, and at the center of this is a question about the Holocaust and Polish Jewish history. Um, I will not take up any more time. Um, I will just say that the, the book that is beneath the book we're going to talk about today called Bondage to the Dead was one of the books that had the strongest influence on me when I was a graduate student in the 1990s. Um, but what I'm going to ask to, I'll, I'll tell you how this is going to go. What I'm going to first ask, ask Professor Steinloff, ask Michael to do is to talk a bit about the book, how it came to be in the autobiographical narrative. And then I will prompt him with some questions. And then I would like to save time for those of you in the audience um, to ask questions. The format for this is that chat is disabled, but the Q&A, Inessa tells me, is enabled. So if you have questions, please type them in the Q&A and I will do my best to scan through them and um, choose as many as we have time for. Um, and Michael's a very friendly person. I'm sure he will try his best <laughs> to answer everything honestly. Um, okay, with that, I'm going to turn that over down to Michael and have him talk to you, uh, tell you a bit about this book, how it came into existence and what it's about. The book is called, This Was Not America. And it's a kind of tangled web of Polish Jewish American history, a, a, a tangle through um, Polish Jewish American history. Okay, so I, I can't talk about this book because it, it refers to another book that was published um, 25 years ago, and that is um, that is Bondage to the Dead, which um, Poland in the memory of the Holocaust. And I have to refer to it. Because uh, this book arose, uh, the current book uh, arose as, as a direct consequence of that book. And, um, and uh, so uh, that book was, well, we have to put Elżbieta Janicka in here. Uh, Elżbieta Janicka, my, my colleague, my friend, um, who at a certain point, uh, some years ago, uh, texted me um, um, saying, uh, I've read your book seven times and, um, and, uh, and, and, then, and then she says, um, uh, it's unbelievable, I love it. And it's, 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 it's absolutely true. And at the same time, it's, it's, it's bullshit. So, <laughs> So this is, this is, um, and so we decided, uh, now, now that book, um, uh, Bondage to the Dead, um, poses the idea that, see, I was trying to, at that time, 25 years ago, deal with the fact that, how do you deal with the fact that, that years, that, that, years or months after the end of the war, people who had hidden Jews still had to hide them. Um, what the hell was that? What is that? Um, you know, and, and, um, and so 
Um, I found I couldn't understand that. And, and so I, I went to uh, the only place I could I felt I could go to is Robert J. Lifton and his notion of trauma. Uh, and he was talking about, uh, you know, things like Hiroshima and so on. Um, so uh, this notion of trauma uh, was then contested um, by Elzbieta and who said, no, 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 it's not, it's not trauma. Um, and, and so uh, we started a conversation and that conversation was in was a kind of uh, you know as as uh, as Marcy says it, it was a vivia dreka it, it covered everything and um, uh, and uh, it covered all parts of my life too so it was partly it's it's, it, it's everything it's partly uh, biographical um, and it's partly you know political it's partly me arguing with her. Uh, about uh, about all of this and about the notion of whether trauma, uh, first of all, I mean, mostly is is the proper uh, word, uh, is the proper concept um, for what it is I had encountered. Um, and she argued, no, it's not it's not trauma. It's 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 just it's it's, it's just anti-Semitism. <laughs> <laughs> basically um and i can i can you know if people ask me about that i can i can you know talk about that a little bit but there's so many there's many different different directions to go in and i was it, it was exciting to be able to uh to look at all these things so i'm i'm, I'm open to to you know I'll, I'll just stop and and uh, uh marcy i mean do you have something uh i mean if there's something that i didn't that I should have explained right right from the get go. Tell me, I'll, I'll do it. But uh, you know, if if uh, I'm, I'm really open to to whatever, I mean, you know, maybe I'll just throw a couple things out for the the audience for the people who are not already in the midst of this conversation. Um, Michael is the child of survivors of the Holocaust. Each of his parents had been married before the war. You know, mm -hmm. each of his parents, you know, lost families you know, during the war, met and married after the war as kind of lone survivors. Michael was born in France after the war. They soon after moved to Brighton Beach. He grew up in a Polish Jewish community in Brighton Beach, speaking Polish, hearing stories about the war. Um, he realizes then Brighton Beach is not actually America. It's something else. Everybody speaks Polish and constantly talks about this war. Uh, <laughs> the little the little environment that I found myself in as a child was that. But mainly, and, and this is not the Brighton Beach of today, because beginning in the 70s, uh, all these Russians moved in, and now everything is a Russian there. Right? This is before. And, uh, okay. And, and um, yeah. All right. So, so this is childhood in Brighton Beach. You then grow up, you have a difficult relationship with your parents. Uh, they, you grow up, you go to Columbia, you're there in 1968, you're occupying the building. There are scenes right out of Strawberry Statement, if everybody anybody remembers that book. You're a revolutionary. You move to Seattle, you try to overthrow the American government with a kind of, you know, eclectic mix of Marxist and anarchist and anti-racist and feminist and, yeah, and, yeah, and Black Panthers. Um, cool. you're, <laughs> correct, right. You go on the run for a while. So you have this very, your generation of 68, you have a very 1968 experience. You're a revolutionary, you're a social justice activist. You go back later, you know, get a graduate degree in East European Jewish history. Your whole, your native language is Polish. You learn Yiddish, you know, as a way into this history that was both yours, but somehow not quite because your parents come from the assimilated Polish speaking intelligentsia. And then you end up after your parents have died, you know, relatively young, you know, in Poland at the end of martial law around 1983, 
coming into this scene of trying to understand the world that your parents came from, you know, in a Warsaw in which there are not very many Jews, but there's a handful of them who are largely the children of Polish Jewish communists who wanted to have nothing to do with being Jews, who are in the midst of rediscovering that they are Jews. And this then becomes your entry into Poland, you know, and your attempt to understand this world that that disappeared before you were born, you know, but that is not gone without a trace because through the cracks, there are constantly things bubbling up from this world that was killed. Um, that's and- cool. Marcy, that's <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> to say more. <laughs> Thank you. So this is this is my little summary of the book. Now there there are two there are a few things in the book I'd like to talk about. Um, Please. Uh, um, but maybe I'll, I'll start with the one that's probably most important for our audience, which has to do with this book, Bondage to the Dead. Um, and that book came out in 1997, um, which when and it it came out when I was I was living in Warsaw, and I don't remember how I got a copy in English. Maybe you brought me a copy in English. Somehow somebody gave me a copy of the book when I was in Warsaw, and it was not yet easy to get. It may have been me. It may have been me. So it may have been you, it might have been Cecile. What 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 year was it that, that it was it was 97? It was the year the book came out. Okay, but I, I wasn't, I don't think I, oh, it doesn't matter. <laughs> you you were there briefly, but various people were coming back and forth. In any case, what this book was about, you know, was precisely the question that I had become obsessed with after two to three months of living in Warsaw, which is that you know, the Jews are gone, but there's an obsession with them. You know, they're gone and they're not gone. And there's not only an obsession with Jews on behalf of, you know, a handful of Americans trying to work through their identity complexes. There's also an obsession with the Jews who are no longer there on behalf of Poles. And this absence of the Jews and what has happened to the Jews has clearly deeply inflected, you know, and weighed upon everything else that is happening in Poland. You know, and so I I came there in the 90s and I'm looking at there's all this anti-Semitic graffiti. There are stars of David hanging on gallows. There are people selling anti-Semitic books and protocols of the elders of Zion alongside, you know, books about Star Wars and Polish translation you know, on, the, on the street. My favorite was was a pickup truck with its with its back open. And on one side, um, on one side was um uh, uh, the the uh, bunch of, of raw meat, you know, that they were selling, the discounted, yeah. and and on the other side was um, um, was what you said, um, you know. Um, yeah, it was that the juxtaposition was kind of extraordinary because Poland was just uh, opening yeah. up. Yeah, on the one on the one hand that, and on the other hand that. So you know, it was it was uh, it was a crazy moment. It was wow. a crazy moment. But I was there. Now, are you talking about seventy nine now? No, no, I'm talking about ninety seven. Ninety seven, right? I'm talking about ninety seven. You were there got, much. When I got there, it wasn't like that. When I got there, uh, things were were softer and gentler, and it wasn't until uh, you know, it was a very different world. Yeah. Yeah, I I got there just as lots of people in the 90s were kind of rediscovering that they might be of Jewish origin, that they were, that their grandparents were communist, that perhaps their parents were solidarity activists. Maybe their parents even had them baptized because at that time the church to uh-huh. to have your child baptized during the time of solidarity when Wojtyla was the patron of solidarity was a sign of freedom. And now they were discovering that maybe they really had Jewish roots. It was right when Kostek Gebert, um, who was one of the people who was important for you when you came in the 80s, had started this new magazine, Midrash, you know, in Polish. You know, and Kostek Kostek was, is, you know, one of the most important um, underground journalism solidarity activists um, who then after in the 90s became Poland's most important foreign correspondent um, in Bosnia during the wars of Yugoslav succession, Um, and also one of the most important actors in the Jewish revival, trying to understand what it meant to be Jewish. And there was this magazine called Midrash that still exists that he began to edit in 1997. Does it it still exist? I heard it closed. I heard it 
It may have closed. I thought it still existed. Last, last year it was gone. Oh, but, that would be sad. In yeah. any case, it, it was basically aimed at closet juice. Um, and in the second issue, there was a half page advertisement that said, do you have Jewish roots? Shimash Shidolsky Kozhenya, you remember this. You know, is, it, is it a secret? You know, is it a problem? Or have you been afraid to talk to your husband or wife, perhaps your children? And it goes on to advertise a confidential hotline. And it says, We just guarantee like, like confidentiality. Uh, exactly. Uh, exactly. You know? It just are, on are that you, model. You, know, are you do suspect you're gay. I mean, right. <laughs> do you suspect this is something that you can't? Uh, and it's amazing. And yet we have to understand, uh, you know, that 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 what does it mean? You know, that that being Jewish, uh, you know, takes that takes that form, takes that the the revelation um, that that one is of Jewish roots is uh, has to be approached in such a crazy, crazy way. It was right after that came out when I actually went to see Kostek, who I didn't even know at the time, and said, is this a joke? And he said, no, it's not a joke. This is very serious. And we get a lot of phone calls. Right. And, and I thought, what, what is this about? And that's when your book came out, when Bondage to the Dead was about. Oh, it was about what, what are these complexes and layer after layer after layer, um, clearly having to do with a lot of repression, you know, a lot of trauma you know, a lot of kind of hints of Freud here and there. There were things that you were trying to figure out. Um, why are, why is Poland so haunted? Why are Poles so haunted? You know, why is there this obsession with the Jews? Um, and is it love and is it hate and is it guilt? And was it, you know, was it participation or was it passivity or was it, I mean, and these are the questions that seemed to me you took on fearlessly in that book with an amazing amount of composure you were just trying to figure it out maybe you could say a little bit about what you were thinking as you wrote it as, as a true american you see i was i was that's, that's the only way i knew how to uh how to approach it you know uh being nice to everybody making sure not to insult anybody um <laughs> uh but uh but but trying to to figure this strange thing out and 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 then I found out, and that's partly where the title of my, the book comes. From. This was not America. You know? <laughs> <laughs> this was not. This was not me. Uh, you know, trying to negotiate uh, uh, something uh, something that's easily understood, uh, because it's not something that's easily understood. And why? Um, back then, twenty five years ago, I was trying to understand why someone who had hidden Jewish children. Uh, still had them after the war, still had those children in his garret and wouldn't let them out. Mm. What the hell was that? You know, what is that? You know, and, and that's, that's insanity in a certain way. But if you're, if you're Polish, not at all. I mean, that, that's, uh, that, that's the way how a lot of people had to deal with this. And uh, anyway, so that's, um, yeah. That that's that's the inspiration for. So my answer back then, from Robert J. Lifton, was trauma. They were traumatized by what they had experienced, what they had seen uh, of Jews dying. Uh, and here comes Elshbieta saying nonsense. It's not what it is at all. Can you tell the audience a little bit about who Elzbieta is? You too. <laughs> but but it's it's your it's because so much of the book is about that relationship. Is an academic and also an artist um, who has written widely about uh, basically a uh, focusing on on uh, most often on on anti semitism uh, and and. Um, and uh, the notion that uh, Polish culture, I mean, this is the opposite of, of the defense of Polish culture, that Polish culture is deeply at its roots mm -hmm. anti-Semitic. And there's a small number of historians, and you know them, of course, mm -hmm. 
who, for whom that is uh, mostly younger even than Elisabetta, uh, who's in her forties or something. But uh, so that was, you know, that that was uh, a contention, a bone of contention. Um, she's so, very harsh. Huh? She's, ve she's very harsh in that. Oh, moment. totally harsh, totally harsh, very harsh. Uh, and I had to cope with that as as I was working as I was writing this book, and it was all for the good. It's all for the good. You'll see. I mean, you know, those of you who who go on from this and actually choose to read the book, you you see it. It at least it's some very interesting interesting places. Uh, but um, I'd like to explore. I mean, this one word. Uh, this word trauma. I know it's very uh, you you told me recent recently that, that it's very catchy nowadays uh, and everybody's talking about trauma well I mean I did a lot of talking about trauma but what is it I mean what is I mean, I'd love to you know uh I mean does, does that seem like a good place to go because I have no idea what trauma is but I use the word all the time <laughs> well, uh, I would, let's let's disentangle I would say. So you were looking at collective trauma in this book, that yes. the witnessing, the witnessing of people being murdered in front of you was right. a collective trauma for the Poles. Right. And today people might say secondary trauma when you're watching somebody else be tortured, you know, when you're like vicariously experiencing something. And the other thing that is very kind of, that is very popular, popular isn't the right word, but that we keep returning to a lot now is intergenerational trauma, which uh -huh. in some sense, your book is about all three of these things, collective trauma, <laughs> secondary trauma, and intergenerational <laughs> trauma. Who knew? <laughs> right. Who knew, right? Uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> Once again, I found myself by accident getting into the uh, most, you know, kind of uh, just completely by accident getting into the trendiest kind of uh, uh, moments, uh, uh, you know. Uh, You're very fashionable. I'm very fashionable. Oh. That's nice to know. I'm pretty <laughs> old, so it's nice to be fashionable still. Oh. I mean, you kept trying to, for me, your book was about trying to understand and yes. for me, it was a model of what historians do is we try to understand, you know, before we condemn or judge or we try to make that imaginative leap and understand what was this phenomenon, what was happening, you know, and you and come then, to this idea of, of trauma and Elspieta is like trauma shmama, they're all anti-Semites. That's, right. <laughs> that's, that's precisely correct. <laughs> no, it isn't. A, yeah, it, it, it's... Uh... The, the root of everything is, um, and one exchange that we had, and with I forget who it was, who it wasn't directly with her, but um, what, um, uh, how could people have done this to people, right? It was like mm -hmm. a question. And she said, no, that's not the question. It's like, people did this, it's like, people did, how could, People did this to Jews, not people. And so that, for me, said a lot. And that, for me, helped me to understand. Um, and is that too elliptical? But you know what I like? People can understand. Yeah. Well, uh, let me now, I mean, one of the questions your book raises, and I, as an American, you know, and as a Jew, and someone who's put, well, spent a lot of time in Poland, right. you spent a lot of time, you know, with your cohort of 1968 in America with activists for gay rights, with feminist activists, with black activists, like you have a, you know, you're coming from a certain kind of cosmopolitan international, internationalist right. sensitivity in which suffering, victimization, scapegoating is not something that happens only to Jews. Right. That must have inflected how you related to Poland when you got there, because you're coming from an America in which racism first and foremost is directed not against Jews, but against blacks. Right, right. And, and, uh, and here, and here was all Jews. So, you know, uh, I don't know, is, is that? <laughs> um, how did your experiences in America then working with American racism and trying to understand it inflect how you understood Polish anti-Semitism? 
How did it? Uh, well, I thought, you know, I came uh, believing that that I could, you know, transpose these experiences directly, um, you know, directly into the Polish situation. Um, that, uh, uh, but then, then, then I was told, no, 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 you, this is not, uh, this is not so. Uh, this is a very different, um, a very different situation, a very different history, a very different uh, everything. Uh, and I came, you know, kind of naively with with this kind of naive American. Uh, uh, what's that book by by Henry James, where where she comes to? Uh, oh, right, uh, right, yeah. Golden no, no. Bowl is the Golden Bowl, I think. Yeah, um, yeah. You know where where she just, you know, I came thinking, oh, you know, here's another, here's another freedom struggle, mm. right? Another freedom struggle. Uh, and uh, that's the way I, I have to approach it, you know, in, in a very personal way. Um, because, you know, and then it turned out, uh, you know, as everything in Europe, it turns out, certainly in Poland, above all in Poland, uh, no, no. Uh, as they say, to sprawa bardzo złożone. <laughs> right? It, it, it's, it's, it's layered. It's layered. Yeah. There's so many things that are that are that that you don't get. And it took me a while to to figure that out. But but uh, am I am I you know is that is that is that reasonable to to say that? I mean, that it's that it's a very complicated question. No, I found it an enormously complicated question. I mean, when I when I read your book, I felt like you ask all the right questions and you articulated them so well and you gave the right examples. But no in the answer. end, you didn't right? there was no ultimate answer. But I and but I, I I empathized with like, yes, that was the right question. And we haven't there's something there we haven't quite gotten to. Exactly. Exactly. And and. Uh... I still haven't, you know. It's in that, you know. I'm I'm an old man now, but <laughs> but has wisdom accompany that? Yeah. I, would, I mean, the, the paradox in the book is that you know you're there as the American Jew, and and Elzbiet is a very self critical Paul, and she's gaslighting you, you know, through the whole second half of the book. Everything you say, you know, she's she's like, but you can't really think that, or you're repressing that, or you're trying not to, or you're doing something circumlocutious so as to excuse people who shouldn't be excused. And I'm still trying to understand, by the way, I, I'm, uh, th there's words popping up that I, that I, I'm still learning how to use, uh, <laughs> gaslighting. Um, um, you know, it's not, it's not clear to me what all that, uh, you know, I finally come closer to, to the notion of trauma, wow. but gaslighting is still pretty far from my, uh, gaslighting is new. I've only recently used it, yeah. but I I'm using yeah. it now in the sense of she's, she's trying to cause you to doubt yourself. Right. Right. Constantly right. critiquing you in a way that well, you as an American your Jew, own. I mean, you know, what else, <laughs> <laughs> you know, any, any Jewish, uh, any American Jewish comedians, you know, <laughs> Will will agree. Yeah. <laughs> what is this? I don't know. Huh? You know, and and uh, and she knows. You know, uh, I had I had a uh, I, I have an Israeli friend who was who was uh, who, who was in the states uh, for a while, and um, maybe you know him, Yoav Pellet, um, and uh, and he uh, I went up to he was staying in a, in a loft way up way up high in in Chinatown. And I went up to see him, and I was it was a really hot day, and and I said, Yoav, this is this is also tells you something about Israeli. I said, Yoav, I just don't get it. I don't understand. And he, and to which he responded, You don't understand? I will tell you. You know, there's only one answer. There's only one answer. At least, yeah. um, so. But so the other thing interesting in that story is that, you know, part of the story is part of an international generation of 1968. You know, on both sides of the Iron Curtain and on both sides of the Atlantic, there was there was an Oedipal rebellion. There was a revolt against the parents, against the silences and complicities of the parents. Um, and one of those things that, you know, in your case is you have these these 
pe- these parents who are coming from the Polish Jewish intelligentsia, who are coming from middle class families, they speak perfect literary Polish and they hate the Poles. They have nothing good to say about the Poles. You spend your childhood listening to this word Voina, 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 you know, which is interesting because it's precisely the word in Russian war, which is banned now in Russia, um, in which everything was subsumed under. They have nothing good to say about the Poles. They don't want to like the Poles all hated them. Sometime you tell this story in the book where you're out with your parents on the street. Somebody hears them speaking Polish and they're like, ah, Rodadzi, like compatriots. You know, yeah. your father's like, ah, oh, Rodazzi, to hell with you. Like, we're not the... Runs away and <laughs> runs away. Takes takes his family, you know. <laughs> you know, it's like protecting us, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, get, let's get away from this person. Yeah. Rodak. Yeah. It's a Rodak countryman. Oh. Yamudam. And, and he just said, Yamudam Rodak. I'll give him Rodak. <laughs> and, and it felt like he was going to punch him, you know. And and you go to Poland and you go to Poland to to commune with a Jewish past, but you also go to Poland with an openness to Poles. You go to Poland with a willingness to speak Polish. You know, you go po- to Poland with a willingness well, to speak Polish. gave you this language, so I better use it. <laughs> <laughs> I was very lucky, you know, <laughs> gave me, you know, and they lied. They said it so so I could under so I could communicate. They they see that was the only kid in Brooklyn in the, that situation. Who who uh, could ha- had an active uh, um, uh, knowledge of Polish? Oh. You know, all the kids like me, they can understand it, but they couldn't speak it. So that's uh, amazing. Why why was that? You know what they told me? They told me so that I could I could speak with my aunt and uncle in, in Paris. Uh, <laughs> that my uncle, my uncle was the was, was my mother's older brother. Oh. They survived. Um, and and that's what they said. So you could speak to, and and not because not because you know it was worthy. Even if there was worthy language, nothing. That's what I grew up oh. uh, being told. Oh. And you, I mean, when I see you in Poland, you know, I feel like one of the things we share is we both love Poland. Not yeah. not not because we don't see what's horrible about Poland, but there's a deep love there. There is. And a deep attachment. There is. Um, it's a it's a beautiful place where people keep asking uh, fascinating questions. And, uh, you know, I mean, that's either a minority, mm. but there's some of them. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And nowadays they're, well, they're there. Of course they're there. Who knows? There's going to be elections? Maybe, maybe. Who knows? Mm. Keep your fingers crossed. <laughs> Maybe the good guys will win. Huh? And how much of that reaching out to the polls was a rebellion against your parents? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Uh, rebe- yeah, I mean, I rebelled against my parents in lots of ways. I'm not mm-hmm. sure that was that was one. Because mm-hmm. uh, my father was long gone by then. You know, mm-hmm. he died ten years before, and and. Uh, and I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Uh, it was an intense desire to to see what what the world see. It, it turned out wrong for me personally. I wanted. I, I didn't want to talk about the Holocaust. You know, mm-hmm. I wanted to talk about the world before the Holocaust. Mm-hmm. You know, I wanted to sh- talk about life. I mean, this is the way I, I talked back then. I want to talk about life, not death. You know, I want to, I want to, you know, find out um, what uh, what this world was about. That that my parents and it seemed like a fascinating world, uh, and so and so I became I became enamored of 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 who of dead Jews. <laughs> you see, and people ask me, well, well, you know, what is this? I mean, who? You know, everyone has their has has like a, a, a group. Everyone has someone who they who they uh, uh, who defines themselves who they, they define themselves against, uh, um, and uh, you know I have this I have this uh, I I think I tell the story in the in the in the book about about uh, about people about uh, these these Chicanos uh, you know you don't use the word Chicanos anymore but back then we used the word Chicanos. Um, uh, Mexican Americans um, 
who talked about who talked about how they uh, how they they had this they had this land um, that's today uh, northern uh, uh, New Mexico and um, um, and uh, well, rather northern Mexico and and southern New Mexico that that the the mythical name for it is Aslan. Mm. Aslan, A-Z-T-L-A-N. And it's a beautiful concept. It's a beautiful thing. And I got really into that back in Seattle because a lot of these, these people talked about Aslan. And then I suddenly realized, you know, that Aslan is 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 like is like is like um the world that Shom Aleichem comes mm-hmm. from, you know, because it's at the same time, it's beautiful, mm-hmm. you know. And 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 at the same time, it's both beautiful and impoverished, totally impoverished, you know. And and who are these Jews? You know, what are these Jews from? You know, these. And it's funny because that's not who my parents were, of course. But mm-hmm. but uh, this notion of of uh, of uh, yeah, uh, we are Jews, uh, and this is our homeland. Okay. And we all have homelands, of course. And uh, uh, but my homeland, when I went back there, uh, was dead Jews. It turned out. Mm. So, but you also met you also met some live Jews and Stashek Krajewski and Kosta Gebert and Monica and and, and uh, yeah and Pavel Spiva mm. who just passed mm. on uh, a wonderful guy uh, a wonderful man. Uh, he, you know, uh, he was head of the uh, Jewish uh, Historical Institute for for some years. Anyway, um, yeah, yeah, and they some of these people were, you know, I, I think they saw me as 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 totally naive. I remember Pavel saying to me at one point, uh, you know, because I, I I was I was into running back then, you know. And and uh, no one, you know, right, <laughs> people yeah. scared dogs on me. You know, <laughs> uh, you know I, I, I was especially I liked uh, in the in the uh, what was that in the um, in the royal in the royal gardens. What's mm-hmm. that? Wajenki. Wajenki. I used to love to run through Wajenki. I love running in Wajenki. Well, you, you were, you know, I would, you know, I was <laughs> out there, you know, and and people would stick their dogs on me, you know. Uh, and laugh, or they even laugh. They say, "Well, what the hell is this guy doing? You know, running?" Um, so, yeah. Uh, what was that an answer to? I, I've lost it. Uh, the live Jews who you met, who were working through what it meant oh, to yeah, be yeah, Jewish. Yeah, yeah. So, 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 Pavel said. So when he heard when he, when I told him about that, he said, "Oh." The, the American wants to live forever. <laughs> you know, the American, yeah, all right, get it. So the American, uh, yeah. And what what did you learn from them? How did that group of people who were connected to solidarity, who were carrying out a Jewish revival, who did not grow up in that Jewish, specifically traditionally Jewish milieu, and were trying to discover it as adults. What did you learn from them? Well, learn from them. I mean, they were just like me, you see, because I didn't, you know, I I didn't grow up speaking Yiddish, you know, Uh, I I wanted to have, I I wished I had. Um, So in a certain way, that that brought me very close to them. and on the other hand, you know, they were they were digging, they were digging, uh, and they were they were creating something uh, new, and that was that was that was really uh, that was really extraordinary, um, you know. Um, I mean, what did I learn from them? You know. It's hard to answer that 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 question. You know, what did I Cause, look? Because they were a certain kind of mediating bridge. There were the dead Jews who you never met. There were the Jews in Brighton Beach who you grew up with, right. and then there were these these Jews who were your generation who you were encountering in this place where had right. things been different, you might have 
been them. You might have grown up there. Oh, easily, easily. That's right. That's right. So I don't know. Uh, I mean, I've often thought I could have been them, but I also could have could have grown up in Israel. You know, uh, my my father had tickets uh, to 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 go there. I mean, he was given. This guy gave him. You know, and he my father thought, like, hmm, sure, should we go? Nah, we won't go. I mean, you know, it was that. I sometimes consider my life, you know, just being, just, if only, if only, you know, this, I mean, not only did I not have a homeland, uh, but who was, who, who were these people, you know, uh, they were Polish Jews, but they also could have been Israelis, I mean, mm. in that way, you know, um, anyway, I think I'm, yeah, does that make sense? It does. And you've spent a lot of your life, you know, working through a relationship with a brother who died uh, before you were born. Yes. Why why don't you why don't you no, I'll, I'll let you tell the audience this story. The story is a is a story. It's uh it's uh my father uh had the the extraordinary good fortune, you know, uh, you know, Jews love irony. The yes. extraordinary good fortune uh, to have gotten married in uh, uh, at the end of 1939 in Warsaw. Um, and shortly thereafter, uh, you know, they made, immediately made a child. Uh he and this woman, it's just not my mother. I mean, you know, he and this woman. And uh, um, and <laughs> as far as I can tell, at the age of uh, uh, this 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 boy, uh, Michal, they called him Michal, but there's all these different words uh, because he was named after my grandfather, Moshe, uh, as was I. Um, or was they named after him? That was never clear. Um, but at the, the age of roughly two and a half, uh, he was killed. He died. Now, it was El Gibieta who helped me uh, really understand the, the most probable way he died. And the most probable way he died was they were, they were, they were, uh, they were hiding. My father was gone. My father was not in their hiding place. And we're talking 19... You know, you're talking 1942, right? Uh, the, after July, after the action and all that. Um, and uh, so, how did this happen? Well, most probably, of course, who knows? Uh, you know, they uh, they were they were in a hiding place, and 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 the child. Who was about two and a half uh, made some sounds, you know, and, and his mom was holding him, and uh, his mom killed him. His mom smothered him. Uh, that was a documented, um, you know. There's enough documentation of stuff like this um, uh, to make that the most probable, although not, you know, some Nazi could have grabbed him and smashed his head against the wall. That's possible too. I've thought of that sometimes. I mean, you know, uh, not nice. And uh, at a certain point, <laughs> okay, you told me you warned me against Dibbuk, but I'll say <laughs> uh, at a certain point late, you know, in, in, uh, in uh, in my life, I'm relatively late. I, I was uh, I, I was living. Uh, my friends were were printers uh, who printed for the revolution, and uh, and I was staying at their place uh, on the Lower East Side. And uh, I felt that that uh, uh, that uh, inside me was was something strange. Was was uh, was something that's now I have to understand, you know, Dibbooks, you know, Dibbooks are there, they're Dibbooks and Dibbooks. There's a nice Dibbook of the of the play, uh, you know, of the of uh, you know, 
But then there's uh, then there's bad dibooks, which which is what they usually are. Like I, I read about one dibook. Someone asked him, "Why did you come back?" Uh, well, I came back. I came back. You know, I had to come back because because I slept with boys. You know, mm. and, and uh, you know, so there's usually something. Except in the play, there's usually something bad uh, associated with there that they have to redress. And uh, how do you address a two and a half year old child? And that's what I experienced. I experienced rage, rage, because, because you know, why did you do this to me? How did I die? You know, what was this? What was this? Uh, and so, you know, and it was in my belly, kind of this kind of turning, this kind of turning and, and uh, yeah turning is really the best word for it I, I you you told me not to but I <laughs> talking about it, but I'm, I'm done I think I mean it, it's uh it's very very uh, and it, it it um it pursued me I mean he pursued me I mean for a while uh I guess it was, it was a sense of, uh, uh, you know, so why did you, you know, why, why did you, meaning plural, mm -hmm. why did you do this to me? Why, how did this happen? You know, and it's, and it's like this rage, this kind of, this kind of, uh, you know, two, two year old rage, you know, but that might be like, I mean, you have kids. I had mm -hmm. two-year-old rage uh, uh, because you killed me. Uh, anyway, so there you go, and that that came out of, and that's in the that's in in, in this book too. Well, there's a lot about him in this book, and I was at the performance in Krasnogruda that huh. maybe may, may you, which was extraordinary. Maybe you could tell the audience about this. Kind of musical well, artistic Gruda, resolution. Yeah, that was that was what what sent him back to wherever he uh, that performance. I mean, was was what's there was this uh, we, we created this performance with the, what's what's the what's the I and this what's his what the musician what's his name? Uh, oh, was it Michal? No, it wasn't Michal. Yeah. No, it was someone. Oh. Oh, he's wonderful. He's a wonderful. He, I, I know. I know who you're talking about. I'll, I'll, I'll look it up. You keep talking. Oh, yeah. All right. But, but anyway, um, and the two of us, uh, he did the music, and I did, and I did uh, various texts that I dug up um, about about uh, about trying to uh, trying to deal with this uh, with this Dybbuk memory. And um, and uh, we it was like a performance we did uh, at Krasnogrudy, and uh, and oh, what's his name? He's still performing. He's a wonderful musician. Um, he's a solo guitar player, uh, among other things. Uh, and uh, so anyway, this this uh, this performance at Krasnogrudy. Uh, Krasnogrudy you know, just is a wonderful, is a magical place in the far northeast of, of Poland, where uh, uh, magical things happen, mm. and uh, and one of them was this, and and they have you know they they bring people together uh, to talk about the stuff we're talking about partly, but years and years later than than you know this than what we've been talking about here. Um, but anyway, that years and years later is, is what allowed me to let go of, uh, or maybe, or maybe he allowed himself to let go. Yeah. No, it's maybe, you know, but, but something happened. Uh -huh. I, I, I'm no longer possessed. Thank goodness. But you were very empathetic to that, that possession or that intimacy. I mean, how can you not be empathetic? Uh, a two and a half year old. Come on. Yeah. I mean, what am I supposed to, you know, curse him? Yeah. He, it's enough that he cursed me, you know? <laughs>
No, the uh, Elspieta's, you know, pr probable scenario. <coughs> hey, where are you? Hey, 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 hey. 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 Technical, technical. Are you back? Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> hey. Yay. Oh. Okay. Uh, what, what was it? What was it gonna okay, say? Okay, so no, the, the scene of the death, because I Michal Gulvinsky, who is another who is a child also in the Warsaw ghetto, um, and wrote wrote a book around the same time in the 90s, Charni Sezoni, which I, I then translated into English. And there's a scene he describes, you know, of of a, a baby in a cellar where everybody is hiding. They don't want to be taken for the deportations. The baby keeps making noise. People are saying you have to smother the baby. Otherwise, we're all going to be caught. I use that scene in my undergraduate seminars. And I say, what you know, what are the ethics of this situation? Do you smother the baby? You know, if this there are no innocent choices in this scenario. No, of course not. And you do. But I have to say, my situation was even tougher because this was not a baby. Right. Okay? This was, uh, you know, a kid who already knew some language, mm. you know. So that that's I would just add that. And, and um, um, yeah. And you say in the book that when your first son was born, you policed his birth. <laughs> so, that, <laughs> so that there would be no my, further delays. I was with my wife, uh, who was, uh, you know, we were together. I mean, we were together. She was, she was giving birth and I was watching over her. And, um, And she was out of it, you know. She, she, the, the, you know, she's out of it. She, the, this child is is coming out. Uh, this baby's coming out, and uh, and I did something, you know. I just wanted to, I just wanted to make sure that uh, that there was no that there wasn't anything around that was going to grab into him, you know, because because that would be a logical thing. Uh, the book, you know, moves out of me and goes into goes into my my son um <laughs> i said i did it this little ritual or something i don't remember really what but that was that was a concern of mine <laughs> says, you're not getting this one you're not getting this one uh-uh oh. so oh. this is i talk about generational you know yeah and this is generational yeah no. Right? no a lot of i mean a lot of our questions now about what led to this anthropological catastrophe in in Russia have kind of gone back to intergenerational trauma, the kind of the idea of things that were not processed, that were not talked about, that, yeah. that right, that keep like experiences under Stalinism that were that were silenced, that one generation passed on to the next generation. There's nothing, I mean, that's going on in Russia today that can compare. To what happened under Stalin is, you know, it's it's not yeah. it's not proportional. Yeah. It's not it's not right. Yeah. I mean, uh, three million was it? Three million people star three million Ukrainians starved to yeah. death purposely. Right. <laughs> you know, I, I think that you know, but anyway, yeah, that that uh, the idea is that what is not somehow worked through or spoken about, or that there's some kind of intergenerational transmission of trauma. You know, okay. that that's that, that's been, I think, where a lot of the discussion is. We're we're running out of time, but I want to get to some of the questions. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one one of them, the the first one from Alexandra um, Kolodzejska, um, I think I know the answer to, but I will let you answer it. Was it possible to detach the personal and generational trauma from the academic aspect while you are writing and researching books? Did you feel like you could somehow compartmentalize your own biography and your family relations as you were being a scholar in Poland? Short answer, no. <laughs> there's, you know, I could discuss stuff. I mean, you know, there's more, there's more to it, obviously, but uh, 
but no. Uh, I mean, part of, I mean, my being in Poland was all about, you know, going where my parents had been. I mean, and 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 feeling the the feelings and and you know, uh, for example, Nalewski, hmm. Nalewski, that that's where I mean that before the war, Nalewski, not today's Nalewski, but before the war, Nalewski was where uh, my mother's uh, lived, where my mother lived, and and where where they had their 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 business and and I would go you know I would the, the you know the addresses were all screwed up so so but but I wasn't um, yeah mm -hmm. you see because originally I went to Poland to 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 work on Yudlam and Peretz uh, mm -hmm. you know and and uh, uh, the great you know uh, Yiddish uh, Yiddish writer the great Yiddish sage. Um, and I dropped that because I thought I needed to write about Poland. So, um, anyway. Oh, oh! Somebody, uh, uh, Kadka's here saying it's Rafael Rog um, Roginski. Oh, okay. I. Um, um, no, who was the the musician? Steve who you were talking to you like this. This is mm. this. This is this is hearsay from somebody. I, I, <laughs> no, no, that's who I was thinking of too. With Rafael, I think it was I think it was Rafael R R Roginski at that performance in Krasnogruda. Ah, ah, ah! Oh, is that who's uh, who's talking now? No, no, no. Somebody else. Somebody else wrote in questions that that was the name of the musician. Yes, yes no, yes, that's that's sure. the person I have. And I'm yes, thinking of. Course. And I sure wish he was out there, but I don't think he is. Yeah, no, I don't think he's on Zoom right now. But no, this is what this is the name I also forgot. But he's I know like I can't praise him. I mean, he's a wonderful guy. Yeah. Anyway. No, it was extraordinary. Okay, let me give you let me give you one more question. This is um this this is a question about there are other children of survivors who grew up hearing, you know, never again and the Poles are anti-Semites, you know, and that's a graveyard. Is there how would you speak to other other children whose parents were survivors or grandchildren of survivors? Should they go back to Poland? How would you encourage them? Absolutely. How would you explain I'd encourage it? them? Let go. Let go of all your bullshit, of all your hatreds. You know, really. I mean, you know, because 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 people like me were were instructed in hatred uh, of Poles. I mean, uh and uh, no, uh, it, it back when, look back when I was in Poland, it was it was it was a place that was a little easier to like <laughs> the Poland of today. Yeah. So you know, with its with its right wing nationalist mm. uh, everything, um, but uh, yeah, but but you will find go to Poland you'll you'll find people you can talk to mm. but and, and people that are fascinating mm. yeah. yeah I mean now there's a right wing government but it's still a divided society there's still mm. that like there's well, still that saying. half of Poland half of, well it's not <laughs> see what I what what I explain to people is that it's just like us right. Uh, here. Exactly. But but there's more of the bad guys, and here there's more of the good guys. <laughs> yeah, the percentage kind of like right. Yeah, the the per the percentage is a topic for discussion. But we could also like ask, look at how Poland has taken in Ukrainian refugees. It's a moment. Oh, yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, it's it's uh God, it's it's beautiful. Oh. It's beautiful, and it and it shows, you know. And then you know, every now and then, you know, because I have I have a, a black son. Uh, every now and then, you know, I think, what if they were? What if they were African? <laughs> mm -hmm. How how quickly? But that's that's mm -hmm. neither here nor there. But you know, and you brought him to Poland. What you brought your son to Poland? Yeah, but uh, it's not exactly a place for for him. No, yeah. not especially not now. No. Yeah. Um, no, um, so many, 
my life, there's so many, there's so many pieces of my life that are unintegrated uh, still. That, that, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. We're, we're just about out of time, but I want to, I want to give you a chance, like having gone through this, it's a remarkable book. I want to recommend it's, it's very easy to read. It's very conversational. You know, it's not, you know, there are, there are scholarly references, but it's not stilted and academic. You know, it's it's very kind of contestatory, you know, and passionate in places. But it's also it's about searching for a way forward, you know, and it's about trying to trying from all of this trauma, you know, to see is there, you know, is there a light? Is there a way forward? Is there a way we can understand? Well, that's people? where that's that's where that's where my my origins in the 60s come because mm -hmm. you know? nowadays people everything's darker. You know, and for the young people too, uh, and that's so sad. Because back then, it had to get better. And what's more, we were there to make sure it's going to get better. That's what the '60s were, you know. And and uh, and today, that's that's uh, it's problematic. That kind of attitudes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but I was I was I was uh, totally. Um, I believe that that uh, despite everything, we would we would uh, we whatever that meant mm -hmm. would, would prevail. Mm -hmm. um, you know. So, so uh, it would be nice if it was the opposite. You know, if if if, if I had started in a in a very negative place, mm -hmm. and as I in the, in my in my, in my age now you know you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. uh, if, if, if i was vindicated uh, in some way and, and but but unfortunately things mm -hmm. things are just getting darker oh. how do you feel now about our potential to prevail how do i feel now about what our potential to prevail potential well you know uh, Maybe you can beat the Russians. I mean, you know, maybe the Ukrainians, maybe they can do it. I mean, that's not out of the question. Uh, God knows. But that would be incredible. And that would be kind of the thing we were dreaming of back then. I mean, you know, the, the forces of evil beaten down. Uh, I don't know. That, that's uh, uh, it's, it's not out of the question. Let's put it that way. And, and uh, and God knows, you know, we, 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 you know, it's possible. It's possible. I, I you know, deep down, I'm not sure I believe that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sure. How do you feel? I want to hold on to that possibility. Good. You know, I also like, like you, I brought children in this world. And since I brought children in this, to this world, I have to believe that the forces of evil <laughs> can be beaten down. Good. Um, um, I'm going to let our audience go. Michael, thank you so much. I wish I could have seen you in person. I hope I will soon, but it was lovely to see you even over Zoom. It was lovely, yeah. It was lovely, yeah. I hope to see the whole family again in Krasnogruda. Yeah, I mean, that would be that would be lovely. We'll see. We'll see. But uh it was lovely seeing you and and this whole uh this whole conversation has been uh, mm -hmm. has been very good. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. We'll see. No, it was wonderful. Thank you so much, Michael. Take care. Thank you to our audience. Peace. Bye-bye.